and I was raped by him. So when I come back home, I told my parent about what happened. And when my mom went and told the police about what happened, my dad went and told my uncle to escape. So my uncle already left before the police get there. One day the village leader be able to find me and he told me that I need to move to live in a safe house because since now they haven't arrested my uncle yet. So for my safety, I have to move to live over there. After that, I moved to live in that center, which is with a lot of girls that been trafficked and went through a situation like me. The counselor will come to me and talk to me about what I've been through. And then one day, she told me about Jesus. She told me about how he died on the cross to love and forgive those people, even those that sins against him. And I cannot understand any of that because my dad and my uncle, who I can see and talk to, cannot even love me, then how can God that I never know, I never met before, love me? And it's really hard for me to forgive them. I also get to go to church every Sunday and one time they have a three-day Bible study then at the end of the day of the class the teacher brought in the red and the green box and the teacher told us that that was the special gift for us and when we heard the word gift we were so excited because growing up we never celebrate birthday or Christmas so that was my first gift and at that time, I was 13 or 14 years old. So all my friend and I, we saw the gift and we tried our best to behave. For me and my friend, it was my first gift and to wait all my friends to get the bus and to come one, two, three, it seemed so long. So we just go ahead and open the box. Box, the first thing I saw was a new pair of flip flop And those mean a lot to me because living in that center, I only get to buy shoe once a year, so that's an extra pair for me, so it's so special. Then there's another item that I love so much in that box, was a stuffed animal. So I used to grow up and eat animal. I never knew that they can make an animal so soft that we can snuggle with. Like growing up, I had no toys, no TVs. I saw the stuff in the moon. While I looked through the item in my shoebox, this question came into my mind. I asked myself that, who did this? Like, who sent me this gift? Because they don't know who I am. Then I start to remember the teacher mentioned that this is from the people that love God and they want to bless us with this gift. The shoebox showed me that even though my dad didn't love me, he didn't want me, but there's a father in heaven that loves me so much and he, he loved me so much that he can make someone that don't even know who I am to send me the box to show me that I am loved and I am vulnerable. Even though my early father didn't love me, but there's a heavenly father that's not
see everyone this morning. Happy you're here. Uh, take out your bulletin insert if you have one. I'm uh, hoping to uh, say something worthwhile that you might want to uh, make a note of or at least write down a reference that you can uh, check me out and talk to me about it later. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, one, John, make sure you watch that monitor very closely. Uh, my, off my office is locked because uh, Steffi brought me a hummingbird cake. And so I've got that safely locked away. Uh, she had no way of knowing, but... Uh, it just takes a knife to open. Oh, gee. <laughs> uh, don't, don't, Lucy, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> uh, since I'm starting, Stephanie had no way of knowing this, but I promised my bride that uh, uh, tonight I would start keto at uh, midnight. Uh, because I want to relinquish the title of the fastest growing pastor in the Southern Baptist Convention. And so, uh, uh, whatever, and there'll be a lot of that cake left, so men's Bible study, you will be able to uh, enjoy some hunting tomorrow night. What's that? We'll share it after the No, we won't. No, we won't. I've got keys to all Next week, Judy and I will be in sunny Florida, enjoying a few days of relaxation um, and trying to uh, beat each other on the golf course in a good way. And speaking for us, uh, for you, will be John Kinsey, who is trained as a lawyer. He uh, worked many years with the uh, Coast Guard, uh, and his specialty was government contracts, and so He's a, an exceptional legal mind, but he's also a uh, minister of the gospel. Um, I try to have uh, a breakfast with him occasionally, and I, I always have to take a notebook with me when I'm talking with John because he just, off the top of his head, comes up with stuff that I, I want to make a note of. So John will be here uh, next week. Some of you uh, might remember a number of years ago we had a singing group here called the Seventh Voice, and uh, John was the, uh, one of the lead singers. Uh, and so you will, rec if you recognize him when he comes in, it's not because of America's Most Wanted; it's because he was here uh, uh, with the, uh, the singers, the Seventh Voice. Shifting gears. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Get me going there, John. Give me my first one. Sometimes it's, there we go. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. 
Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Let's pray. Now, Lord, we pray that you take these words, instructions from the Apostle Peter, help us to apply them to our lives in a good way that we can be more effective servants of yours. In your name we ask and pray. Amen. Thank, thankful and a, a shout out to uh, Pastor Ray Pritchard of Keep Believing Ministries. Got me going on a number of these uh, thoughts. We do live in strange times. Someone has called this the age of anxiety. And it seems appropriate enough. Patience is in short supply everywhere. People honk or yell at the slightest provocation. There is an increase in road rage on our highways. Did you know that 66% of traffic fatalities are caused by aggressive driving? The two truck drivers back there can swear to that. A total of 12,610 injuries and 218 murders have been attributed to road rage over a seven year period on our highways. Aggressive driving played a role in 56% of fatal accidents between 2003 and 2007. Virginia Brazier wrote a poem a while back called The Time of the Mad Adam. See if you can connect with any of this. This is the age of the half-red page and the quick hash and the mad dash, the bright night with the nerves tight, the plane hop and the brief stop, the lamp tan in a short span, the big shot in a good spot, and the brain strain and the heart pain, and the cat naps till the spring snaps and the fun's done. Interesting. Now, if I would have told you that that had been written uh, last week, it would, it would make perfect sense. But that poem was in fact published in the Saturday Evening Post in 1949. So the world we live in today and all the crazy things that are going on, humanity is no stranger to that. For months, we've been reminded about the uncertainties of life. Tight race, tight race, for the White House, and I pray you'll do your part. Nine hurricanes, 25 named storms, and three major hurricanes with still 21 days to go in the hurricane season this year. 72 missing and exploited children have been rescued by U.S. Marshals in Indiana, Ohio, and Georgia. You rarely see anything on the news about that. 255 homicide, homicides in the city of Baltimore as of last Tuesday for 2020. We live in strange and even dangerous times. The automatic transmission was invented in 1921 by a Canadian guy who was modified, improved, GM bought the patents, and the first automatic transmission mass produced uh, by a major company, it was Oldsmobile in 1940. They introduced it in the Cadillac in 1941 and the Pontiac in 1948. Some of us old timers will, will remember that when a buddy got a new car, they would ask three on the tree or four on the floor. And sadly, they said, no, I got a Prindle. How many have no idea what a Prindle is? Okay. Park. Reverse, yeah, yeah. neutral, or that. drive, or brittle, right there in your car. Judy and I have, oh, only 4% of vehicles have a manual transmission available on the market today. In some cars, you, it's not even an option. You can't get it. Uh, Judy and I have had three cars with a stick, and, and she got really good at it uh, and uh, practiced when she got used to it. Uh, my father's church 
had a 12 passenger 65 Chevy van that I was able to drive occasionally. And, and it was the kind with no hood where the front was flat oh. and you're sitting over <laughs> the wheels. And you know, so that turning radius was a little bit awkward and had a free on the tree. So it was an awkward vehicle to drive. And we're riding around and Judy says, do you mind if I try that? I, I, I don't know the whole conversation, but I remember she was willing to, to give it a go. And it was, it was going okay uh, until we got to the top of a hill that had a stop sign. <laughs> and any of you that have ever driven a stick know uh, that that can be uh, very, very challenging. I was thinking about the subject matter, and there's a website out there uh, one of my sons introduced me to is called the the art of manliness the art of manliness.com and it says every man should know how to drive stick now i'm going to extend that to the ladies too but here's a quote from that article driving stick is simply more fun if you've only driven with an automatic transmission your entire life you don't know the fun you've been missing driving an automatic feels passive and artificial like you're merely pointing or steering the car instead of controlling it. With a manual, you can actually feel like you're part of the car and you're attuned to its vibrations and noises. Plus, manual transmissions are proactive instead of reactive. You get into the gear you need instead of waiting for the automatic transmission to hunt for the right one. Now, how many here remember learning to drive a stick shift? Couple, oh, quite a few, okay. Zig Ziglar has a great story. When I first heard this story, I, I just, I was just, uh, I couldn't hardly uh, contain myself. Now, I can't do it in the Yazoo City, Mississippi accent that Zig Ziglar is so famous for, but I'll try and give you a quick version. He says, when you're learning to drive a stick shift, you set the handbrake, you mash the clutch, I remember him saying, you mash the clutch, turn the key, release the handbrake, feed it a little gas, and let the clutch out slowly. Too much, too much, too much, and it stalls out. And then you try again. You reset the handbrake, you mash the clutch, you turn the key, you release the brake, you give it a little gas, you let out the clutch slowly, and you kind of jerk to motion, and Many times it'll stall again, but you just keep at it. You see, it takes time, patience, endurance, and energy. But if you stick with it before long, you can mash the clutch, feed the gas, shift the gears, tune the radio, grab a piece of gum, roll down your window, and talk about your neighbor all at the same time. That is from Zig Ziglar. Back in the late 70s, uh, I had a job, traveling job, and I bought a, a 78 Toyota Celica with a five speed. And I was driving a thousand miles a week all over upstate New York, up and down mountains. And it got to the point where it was subconscious. I didn't have to mentally think about the clutch <laughs> and the gears. I could, I could feel the car and know when I needed to upshift or downshift. It was almost like having an automatic but it was subconscious. I didn't think about it. We drove that car for many years. Judy uh, drove that car. Uh, we, we enjoyed that car. John Maxwell says there's a difference between good intentions and good actions. All of us have good intentions. We know people that have good intentions, but many times they leave it at that and they don't transmit that into good actions. We need to see our road, we need to know where we are going, and we need to be intentional about getting there. Dave Ramsey talks about being intentional about getting out of debt. Chris Hogan talks about being intentional in his book, Inspire, Retire Inspired. Dave Ramsey warns that if you're not intentional about your finances, one day you might need a recipe for Alpo Helper just to make ends meet. It's not a pretty sight. Jesus himself was intentional. 
He had a short life, only 33 years. And only, uh, 30, or only three years of that was active ministry. But we know two truths about Jesus' life. First, we know he was sent. And second, he was sent to bring light. Jesus mentions that he is sent by God 42 times in John's Gospel. Jesus said in John 9, we must do the works of him who sent me. He was intentional. He came from God. He makes it clear his life was a mission directly from God. In John 12, he said, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. And Jesus wants us to be intentional. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard of him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? That's where we come in. In our text this morning, the Apostle Peter is challenging us. And as you can see in your bulletin insert, if you have that, we have five forward gears that we're going to run through. First gear... We need to shift our mindset. We need to shift our mindset. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. That's what the NIV says, prepare your minds for action. King James says it a little more cryptically. A literal translation is, gird up the loins of your mind. And most people say, huh? What in the world's that mean? If I told you that when you go home, I want you to gird up the loins of your mind, many would be clueless. In the first century, men wore long flowing robes. And if they were going to, and they, they had a belt around the middle, and if they were going to do some really hard work or do some running, they would pick up that and tuck it into the belt so that their legs would be free. It made it easy to move fast. That was called girding up of the loins. An equivalent in today's language would be roll up your sleeves, take off your coat, and let's get to work. That's why the New English Bible translates it, be like men stripped for action. That is, roll up your sleeves, take off your coat. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. That means don't let your mind get fat and lazy. The mind wanders unless we strictly control it. I remember in a men's Bible study, I keep hearing this squirrel, squirrel. Well, one of the fellas there, his, when he got an email notice or some kind of a message, squirrel, and it would, it would, it would distract. And any of you that have ever walked a dog that have seen a squirrel know that they can get distracted very, very quickly. Spiritual trouble always begins with a lazy, undisciplined mind. Our problems start between our ears. First we think it, then we dwell on it, and then we do it. So it is with anger, bitterness, impatience, lust, greed, and every other sin that would befall us. If you want to be holy, you've got to learn to control your mind. God has no use for a believer with a flabby mind, and you will never be effective for God with a flabby mind. We need to learn to think, think hard, and think things through very carefully. Too many teens and adults let raging hormones and the heat of passion ruin their lives and settle for less than God's perfect will in their lives. The Apostle Paul uses a similar expression in Ephesians 6, 4, where he instructs us to stand firm with a belt of truth about our waist. The only way to gird up the loins of your mind is by using the belt of truth to cinch it tight with God's word. If we're going to be strong in these days of immense moral confusion, we must gird up the loins of our minds. And the only way to do that is with the belt of truth, the Word of God. Shifting into second gear, we need to shift our focus. Our, 
text this morning says, be self-controlled. The next instruction is very simple. Be self-controlled, or in another translation, be sober. The underlying Greek word, word means wine less, W-I-N-E, less. It speaks of the need to be free from the clouding influence of alcohol or any other narcotic stimulus. For that reason, you find a whole lot more fights and trouble in the parking lot of a regular bar than you do a salad bar. Because in a regular bar, people get uninhibited as they consume alcohol. Alcohol and other stimulants can drag you away from God because they can cloud your thinking, cloud your mind and your spiritual judgment. In a broader sense, the Greek word means to be free from anything that clouds your moral or spiritual judgment. Anger can cloud our judgment to the point where we totally lose control. What could cloud our spiritual or moral judgment? Any number of things. A wrong friendship, a harmful TV show, a habit you know that is hurting you, certain music, atmosphere where you work, certain mementos from the past, love of new fads and fashion, a desire for acceptance can do it. Let me put it this way. There are some people you ought not to be friends with. There are some books you ought not to read. There are some TV shows you shouldn't watch. There are some places you shouldn't go. There are some movies you shouldn't watch. There are some internet sites you shouldn't visit. There are some people that you shouldn't date if you're single, especially if, if you're, uh, I guess that would apply if you're single, right? Well, both ways. There are relationships. There are some relationships that are no good for you. There are some jobs that are not good for you. There are some habits you need to break. There are some songs you shouldn't listen to. There are some people who will only drag you down. Now, I am not going to offer you a list of TV shows or movies. That's not my business. But most of us, in fact, you really know the truth about these things already if the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit will tell you that ah, this is this is not good. It's not good for you to be reading this or watching this or looking at this or being here or doing there. The Holy Spirit will tell you. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, He will give you clear guidance. Unfortunately, many people won't listen. But even the Holy Spirit of God cannot help you if you reject His leading. Keep your eyes open. Don't let anything cloud your vision. That is Peter's message to us. Focus. The next thing, we need to shift our goals. We need to shift our goals. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. We all set our hope on something. A student sets his hope on graduation. A bride sets her hope on her wedding day. A candidate sets his hope on winning an election. We all set our hope on the true controlling interest of our lives, whatever that might be. Peter says, you will see Jesus when he returns to the earth. Keep your eyes on the prize. Let me tell you something. There is no Bible prophecy unfulfilled that prevents Jesus from coming back this afternoon. It is quite possible that everyone in this room and listening on the broadcast will see the Lord Jesus Christ come back in the clouds. There is no reason that could not happen. And that's the way we should be living our lives. The Christian life is not a hundred yard dash. It's more like a marathon. We just got to keep on plugging. Keep on running and don't stop until you see Jesus at the finish line. The race is so hard, so long, so difficult, and at times so discouraging, you'll never finish if you don't keep your eyes on the goal. 
Sometimes the slightest distraction can be disastrous. Once in the Olympic Games in Athens, American Matt Emmons was one shot away from winning a gold medal in the men's three position 50 meter rifle competition. He was leading by three points. All he had to do was get near the bullseye and he had it in his back pocket. He took careful aim, he fired, and his target did not register. He hit. He was, he was on lane three and he hit the target on lane two. And the judges could not give him any points. And he went from first place to eighth place and out of the medal altogether when he had it in his back pocket by uh, being able to focus on the goal in front of him. It happened because he took his eyes off the target and he aimed in the wrong place. And the same thing can happen to any of us spiritually. We hear a lot about climbing the ladder of success. That's well and good, but pity the poor fellow who climbs to the top of the ladder and finds out that he's leaning against the wrong wall. Peter is very clear what he says. Precisely to the measure we believe in the second coming of Christ, in that same measure we will find the power to be holy. Often we downplay about the second coming and we, yeah, we kind of uh, laugh about it. We talk about these people who, who make their charts and they make their predictions and that type of thing. But the reality is if we lose the sight of Jesus' second coming, we can lose our number one motivation for Christian living. When we keep the coming of Jesus squarely in view, we will have the zeal to share the gospel, the courage to face suffering, and the strength to turn away from the fads of the world. The second coming of Jesus makes us accountable. There is no more powerful agent of change in the human behavior than accountability. If we understand that one day we will give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ himself of how we live. If that truth ever grips us, truly grips us on the inside, it will change the way we live. It will change the choices we make, the friends we keep, the words we speak, and the path we follow. Peter says, keep your eyes on the goal. Do more real quick. Fourth gear, we need to shift our lifestyle. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Jesus calls his readers obedient children and contrasts that with the way they used to live before they came to Christ. Now, some of us were saved as children. Others were saved as adults. And for those that were saved as adults, you know what you were before you came to Jesus. You were ignorant of spiritual things. Not dumb, ignorant of spiritual things, two different things. You did what you did because you didn't know any better. And even if you knew better, you had no power to change your life until you met God, until you met the Lord. That's what the word conformed means. Back then you didn't know any better. Now you do. So watch how you live. When we adopt the habits, mannerisms, dress, speech, and distinctive traits of the world, we are covering up our true identity as God's children. We are believers masquerading in a costume of the world. Don't do it. Let your life by its outward character Demonstrate the inner change that Jesus has made in your life. We must make a choice, a character-shaping decision to break with the old life once and for all. And we can be exactly who God wants us to be. Fifth and final, kicking into overdrive here, a standard of conduct. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. We know God is holy. Holiness is the essence of what it means to be God. 
And if you are a Christian, there ought to be a family resemblance. God's children ought to reflect their father's basic character to the world. As a Christian, I bear the name of the Heavenly Father, and so do you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. To be holy means to live so that others will think well of Him. <clears throat> to be holy means bringing credit to our Heavenly Father by what we say and do. It means living so that those who don't know Jesus know Him because they can see Him in us. Being holy means living so that others will say, that person serves a wonderful God. So that God would look down from heaven and say, that's my boy, or that's my girl. I've told this before, but it fits here. In the days of Alexander the Great, a soldier was charged and tried for desertion. They brought him before the emperor, and he, Alexander the Great said, what is your name, soldier? And he said, Alexander, sir, he just shook his head he said, change your behavior or change your name. We bear the name of God everywhere we go, and it ought to make a difference in how we live. I would say this, if you're not going to act and live like a Christian, please stop telling people you are one. Tell them you're a heathen and help us in reverse, all right? Notice one final thing in the text. Verse 15 says, Be holy in all you do. Philip's translation says, translate that, in every department of your life. Holiness begins with trivial details. If holiness does not show itself in the small things of life, where, pray tell, will it ever be seen? Most of life is made up of small things. We can't say it doesn't matter what I do because it does. The true standard of living for the Christian, the true model to be copied, is nothing less than God himself. Peter is saying we are God's children and there ought to be a family likeness. God says be like me. Holiness is not a set of rules and regulations. Holiness is about God. God, when I wake up, God in the shop. God around the breakfast table. God on the way to work. God in the classroom. God in the showroom. God in the office. God in the factory. God at lunchtime. God during the break. God on the way home. God at the supper table. God watching TV. God reading email. God surfing the, while surfing the internet. God on the telephone. God at bedtime. God while I sleep. God in the morning. All over again. In every detail. In every place. In every relationship in every word, in every thought, in every deed, in my private moments, God with my friends, God with my enemies, when I'm happy, when I'm sad, the good times, the bad times, when I have faith, when I have doubts, when I succeed, when I fail. God above me, God below me, God before me, God behind me, God all around me, God within me. God always and forever, God first and last, God under my feet, above my head, all around me, guiding all I do and say, God, in my deepest thoughts, always God, always there, always with me now and forever. This is true holiness. This is the path to true joy. This is the purpose for which we were created. And without God, I have no meaning, no purpose, and no reason for being here. Someone once said we've conquered outer space, but not inner space. But is that exactly right? A message like this calls for searching, self-examination. It's always easy to point a finger and think, ah, you know, so-and-so, that would have really helped them out. Remember the old spiritual. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. When it comes to being full of God, we all have a long way to go. Now, it was not my intent to make anyone uncomfortable today. If you are, that is probably the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart, moving you to make changes, to shift gears, 
in your life. Let's all stand together. As the praise team comes. And have a word of invitation. We're all this morning standing in the room of prayer. God and the Holy Spirit might have put something on your heart this morning, something that I have no idea what's going on in your life, but the Spirit has touched your heart and said, here's an area. This is something you need to take care of. This is something you need to start doing or stop doing or surrender to me. This is what he's talking about. I have no idea, but you do. And this is the time to talk to God about it. Now, Lord, be with us now in the next few minutes. Help us to love you with all our hearts and to attempt to be holy as you are holy. In your name we ask. Amen. Dressed up costumes? Sure. 
Okay. I can't remember if this is the costume thing or if it was. Yes. Okay. Okay.